All right. Good afternoon, dear saints. This video is intended for the Church of God, which is the Church of the Living God, the pillar and ground of truth. Please get your authorized version of the scriptures. And please read along with me, word for word, verse by verse, at the scriptures we will be reading today. Read along with me, be a Berean, search the scriptures daily, what are these things be so. Read along with me because the mouth goes quicker than the brain. Okay? Sometimes. 2 Timothy chapter 2. I want to discuss with you twice mentioned. Second Timothy chapter 2, verse 15. Study. Study. It takes time. It takes diligence. It takes um, attentiveness. But like it says in the book of Ecclesiastes, much study is a weariness of the flesh. But we are commanded in Scripture. Study. To shew thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Saints, we know that as being dispensational. I have encountered and seen and witnessed, when it comes to this verse, even those uh, Christians who use the authorized version, they, they seem to, okay, they'll, they'll get that needeth not to be ashamed, like that devil Mark the messenger who uses the scriptures. But when it comes to this verse, he would stop at needeth not to be ashamed. Oh, gee, I wonder why. Kent Helvind himself. Sometimes he, he would eventually, and some of the one he did uh, the entire verse, but he was never dispensational, okay? He stopped also not to be ashamed. Rightly dividing the word of truth, being dispensational, very important. It's very important to be dispensational. But we're concentrating on study today. Study, okay? In Isaiah 28, in Isaiah chapter 28, we've gone over this before, but uh, with a beautiful conversation that we had last night um, about second mention. When you study scripture, dear brother, dear sister, we have to be on guard of becoming too familiar with the scripture. Now, we are... To know the scriptures, yes, what I'm getting at is the mechanical reading of it as if, okay, I've step one, step two, step three, I've done my reading for the, no, we have to be on guard of that. We have to. Uh, one of the things that I pray daily, it's like, Lord, give me eyes to see, ears to hear, and an understanding heart. Help me to see the scripture with new eyes every time I read it. That way, it does, you don't allow it to be stale to yourself. Stale. And some people can read the scriptures as if a robot is doing it, like blah, 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 that kind of stuff. And there's life missing from it, even though this is the word of life. Okay? And there are two comparisons here. In Isaiah 28, we've talked about this, but to what we're going to be talking about, it's very important for us as saints. Verses 9 on to verse 13. Whom shall he teach knowledge? And whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast. Hold your place there and go to... Uh, what is that? Um, 1 Peter... Chapter 2, I believe that is. 1 Peter chapter 2. I believe it is. We will find out. I believe it's 1 Peter chapter 2. Yes, it is. Yes, 
First Peter chapter 2, verses 1 on to verse 3. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, if so ye have tasted, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Now, you might argue, well, we're supposed to be on going on to meat. Yes, but milk never hurt nobody unless you're lactose intolerant. But as far as the word or this, okay, is concerned, okay, and the, the, go back to Isaiah, that verse, verse 9, even addresses itself because milk is for the babe and strong meat are for those who have their uh, senses exercised by reason of use. Yes, but who's receiving the sincere milk of the word? Saints. People who love the Lord, believe the word, and seek to live their lives in accordance with the word. This, this is absolute truth. And this is our foundation. Okay? <gasps> Brad, Jesus Christ is our foundation. Yes, he is. And he's going to guide you on to this. Jesus Christ is our foundation. No other, no other foundation can he lay than that which is laid, and that is Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ is going to guide you on to the authorized version of the scripture. Okay? This, our faith is based upon Jesus, and we build our faith upon reading his word, the authorized version of the scriptures. Comprende? Okay? So, so, and when we who are being fed, who have fed of the milk of the word, we pay attention to every precept. For precept must be upon precept. Study the issue thyself approved unto God. That a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This is not talking about rightly dividing. It's talking about how you handle and approach the word of God. For precept must be upon precept. Precept upon precept. Line upon line. Line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Okay, here a little and there a little. Okay? Right there is a good way for us to read the scriptures. Now, he has given more people, uh, different people, different allotments of time like he has with me. Okay, he's given ample time to study and stuff like that. Some don't have that. But you are still to study here a little and there a little, at least. Okay? And see, someone who is drawn from the milk, or weaned from the milk and drawn from the breast, you're getting the milk to grow, the sincere milk of the word, and then you go on to the meat. Okay, but see, babes, those who are saved, come from that, the sincere milk of the word. And to grow continually, you learn that precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, then there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to this people. And of course, you can read 1 Corinthians chapter 1 about, you know, how he has chosen the weak and beggarly things of the world to confound those, those who are wise, talking about those who are wise in this world, okay? All right? To whom he said, this is the rest wherewith ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet ye would not hear. Now, the mechanical aspect. See, the first part of that is someone who is saved, for our instruction and in righteousness here, and is feeding from the sincere milk of the word and going onward to get meat. But the foundation is that they're saved. And they're searching the scriptures diligently whether these things be so. But someone who is religious or has, uh, or, or has just whatever, it can become a mechanical thing. But the word of the Lord was on to them. Who are the them? The ones they would not hear. The ones who would not hear. Ever learning. And never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Who read the scriptures to try to justify a heresy. Or worse themselves. On to them. The ones who will not hear. But, on, but the word of the Lord was on to them. Precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward 
and be broken and snared and taken. Because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Lord, because they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them. Why? Because they are spiritually discerned. And I've seen this. People who are lost, trying to do things in the scriptures. They just go crazy with all kinds of weird heresies and stuff like that. Okay. But they'll, you know, get on their computer programs. They'll, you know, line upon line. But because they're not saved. Okay. Because they're not weaned from the breast or drawn from the breast. Okay. And remember how John was in... Um, the Lord laid his head on the Lord's bosom, Abraham's bosom, as a nursing father, okay, the references, okay, with the word, all right? You got me, saints? So, while the one studies to basically, if, if, if at all, to justify themselves and, or, and ultimately showing that they're not of us. We the saints. We read this book for life. For comfort, encouragement, for rebuke, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Mm -hmm. And this precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. Verse 10. Line upon line, line upon line. Here a little and there a little. Have you ever been reading the scriptures? And you come to a verse that you just don't get. And you look at it. And you look at it. I mean, and really look at it. Because you could read the verse of Scripture. Just read it. Good. But there are some verses, and especially, you know, this happens with all saints, I would hope, where you come to that one verse of Scripture, whatever it is, and you just read over it, you know, it's like, okay, I read that. But then the Lord's like, go back to that verse. I myself have sat in this very chair looking at a verse. Just looking at it. Looking at it. Precept upon precept. Precept upon precept. So where you look at every single solitary word. It's like you look at the verse, it's like, okay, Lord, there's... There's a treasure in this particular verse that I can't see yet. Lead me, guide me. So I have sat here and looked at every single solitary word. How the, how the verse is structured. And see, and this is where the deception of the devil comes in. Okay? The, this is the perfect and errant, given by inspiration, word of God, the authorized version of the scriptures. And, and people will say, well, men were the ones who crafted how the verses and the words were placed. No, no. God used men, yes, but the Lord is the one who wrote the scriptures. These are arranged and organized as the Lord would have them to be arranged. For example, you read the non-King James, it has a lot of the same nuances, if you will. I hate that word. Give me a better one. But the verses are structured differently because man does it. The structure of the verses here that we have in Scripture are from the Lord, okay? Not the translators, okay? They did the translating, okay? But the Lord was the one whose hand was on this, okay? Okay? The verses of Scripture are arranged specifically to the Lord's liking. And there comes times, brethren, when you're going to have to look at a verse and consider every single solitary word. Every word. Like look at verse 3. Just an example. Okay? The definitive article, crown, Corona, something that someone puts on their head, okay, right? All right? Of pride, thinking that you are your own God, okay? This is just an example. The definitive article, drunkard, drunkards, people who are intoxicated, not sober, of Ephraim, shall be trodden, walked over, underfoot, under feet, okay? 
There comes times, like I said, you just need to sit there and actually look at the verse. Look at it. Pay attention to it. Because a lot of the contradictions uh, that people will come up with, um, when you stop and actually just sit there and look at the verse, it's like, Dude, it's self-explanatory. What's your problem? Okay? I'll never forget how I've heard it said. There may be a problem with your reading. Now, hey, I read too fast sometimes. <laughs> Siva! <laughs> Thank you. Seriously. Siva. Not skeva, siva. Thank you. But I read too. I read too fast sometimes. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. But see, there are other times when I have been came to a verse and I just kind of like sit here, look at it, look at it, examine every word, every letter, realize that the verse you're looking at is the way the Lord wants it. But see, you get a Bible and they jumble it all up and change things, take things out, add things in, blah, blah, blah. And it's lost. The Bibles aren't the Word of God. Scripture is the Word of God. And when reading God's Word, you have to do that sometimes. You ought to do that sometimes. Okay? Just look at it. Examine it. Take your time and look at the verse. You know, go off on the rabbit trails for every single word in Scripture. And you'd be amazed at what the Lord would do. What the Lord would do. Have you noticed in Scripture that there are certain times where things are mentioned twice in one verse? Hmm? Have you ever noticed that? For example, okay, for example, go to Genesis chapter 22. Young brother, you got your head on right. Love you very much. Kicking and screaming, boy. Where you take your time with one verse, you have a question. I'm always open for questions, absolutely. But sometimes all of us, we need to sometimes slow down. And when we come to a certain verse, you know, I've had times where it's like, I um, have my devotional time with the Lord and go into the kitchen and be with my wife. Then I come back, I come back to that verse, man. And I'll just look at it. My wife's like, Brad, you've been sitting in the same place for over two hours or over an hour. It's like, yeah, I'm, I'm stuck on this one verse. She's like, why that one verse? It's like there's something there that I'm not seeing. And I'm just waiting on the Lord. And just going through the scripture and comparing scripture with scripture. It's like, what are you trying to show me? What am I not seeing? Okay? But this thing about twice mentioned. Okay? I want to show you this. Genesis chapter 22, verses 7 on to verse 12. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father. And he said, Here am I, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood. But where is the lamb for a burnt offering? Here's a good one. And the Bibles messed this up. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb. Who is on the cross? Who is on the cross? Okay. Who is on the cross? Okay. Look at Trinitarians. Okay. And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord, now pay attention. Now, and the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. 
It's like, Fred, that's no... Is it? Is it? Is it something? That's not a big deal. Is it? Hmm. Abraham, Abraham! And he said, here am I. Wait, you don't think the Lord could have gotten his point across with just one speaking of his name? Hmm? Come on. Come on. The Lord who spake everything into existence. You don't think he could get his point across by saying, hey! But no. I mean, yes, he can. But he says, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God. There will be a link in the description box. Atheists love to attack this. Um, atheists love to attack this. Well, you say God knows everything. He didn't. The knowing here is a relational knowing. God knows everything. God knew what he was going to do. The knowing there. That's one of those verses where you look at it, it's like, good example. Here's a good example right here. Got the video, which we go through and we talk about it, okay? But here's a good example. God knows everything, right? Then you come to a verse like this, and he says, For now I know that thou fearest God. And an atheist, not saved, rightful, okay? Legitimate question. It's like they come to you, it's like, you say God knows everything. It's like, yes, he does. Explain this. What do you do? The answer is a relational knowing. Okay? I know them through relationship. Okay? Not a knowing as if he didn't know. Like I said, uh, why did God tempt Abraham? will be in the description box. We'll go over that in depth. This is not the main point of this video. Okay? But it is in a way because to answer it yourself, because that, hey, they come to you and that's part of the, that's what we do. But when it is, it's like, okay, explain this. You say God knows everything, explain this. The, the knowing there is a relational, not that he didn't know what Abraham was going to do. He experienced. He went through that knowing relational thing of Abraham willing to uh, sacrifice his only begotten son. All the tie-ins for that are beautiful. Absolutely beautiful, okay? But here's an example, okay? How would you answer that if you don't know it already? Or precept upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little and there a little. See? Okay? Take your time and look at the entire verse. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. Oh, okay, okay, Brad, well, what about verse 11? Abraham, Abraham. That was not just to get Abraham's attention, because like I said, the Lord could be like, hey, whoa, okay? And you want to um, want to say, well, he needed to, no. The minute you start saying something like that, what is God inept? Be careful with that. No, there's a specific reason why it's Abraham, Abraham. Okay, now I kind of skipped this, but I, I wanted to go to this right away. Go now, while it's in numerical succession, go to Genesis chapter 41. Brother, sister, when you see something in Scripture, sometimes you'll read in Scripture where like a word will be used twice, but yet in different ways within that verse. That's a signal to you, saint, that, ooh, I better pay extra close attention. When the Lord says something like that twice, Abraham, Abraham, okay? Lord, Lord, we'll, 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 get, we'll get to that. We'll get to that one. That's, that's the obvious one, okay? That's the obvious one. But when the Lord does things like that, that is when you, as a saint, in the scripture ought to be like, Maybe I ought to pay a little bit more closer attention. Huh? Huh? As a saint, okay, given the sincere milk of the word, being drawn from the, drawn from the breast, 
Precept upon precept, precept upon precept. You get it? You get it? We're not going to address the other half of that because this is for you and me. Okay? You get it? So, okay. Genesis chapter 41, verses 1 on verse 8 to start. And it came to pass at the end of two full years. That That's not a, with the two full years thing, that's not a coincidence. Those don't exist. That Pharaoh dreamed, and behold, he stood by the river, and behold, there came up out of the river seven well-favored kine and fat flesh, and they fed in the meadow. And behold, seven other kine came up after them out of the river, ill-favored and lean flesh, and stood by the other kine upon the brink of the river. And the ill-favored and lean flesh kine did eat up the seven well-favored and fat flesh and fat kind. So Pharaoh awoke. <laughs> Two years. The seven thing we're not touching on. This video is twice mentioned. Okay? So, two years. He woke up. And he slept and dreamed the second time. First one, two full years. Second time, two dreams. Okay? Don't, brother, sister, don't miss that. Study to do thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, okay? And he slept and dreamed the second time. And behold, seven ears of corn came up upon one stalk, rank and good. And behold, seven thin ears, and blasted with the east wind, sprung up after them. And seven thin ears devoured the seven rank and full ears, and Pharaoh awoke. And behold, it was a dream. What are we reading? To verse 8, right? Wrong one. Yes, to verse 8. And it came to pass in the morning. Oh, and Pharaoh awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Verse 8. And it came to pass in the morning that his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all the wise men thereof. And Pharaoh told them his dream, but there was none that could interpret them to Pharaoh. And you can make the tie-ins with uh, Daniel all you want, all day. Now, it's like, okay, so twice, Pharaoh had, excuse me, Pharaoh had two dreams. Okay. Verses 32 on verse 36 now. Here's the fascinating interesting part for you, brother, sister. Joseph, before Pharaoh, going to give him the interpretation of the dream. 32 on 36. And the plant up, and for that the dream was doubled onto Pharaoh twice. We only really need to read verse 32, but it's important for us to get the context because of the after effect of this. Check this out. And for that the dream was doubled onto Pharaoh twice. Look at this, brother. It is because the thing is established. By God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. With what we just looked at in Genesis uh, chapter 22, was that not with uh, um, with Isaac? Established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass? Abraham, Abraham? You get it? Saint, brother, sister? Is that a little light bulb going on? Yeah? The twice mentioned thing? Abraham, Abraham! And for that the dream was doubled unto Pharaoh twice, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Abraham, Abraham. Don't kill Isaac. Now I know. Relationally, they fear the Lord. Now I, I've experienced it with our relationship. See, because a lot of this people do. I tell people, the brethren, that I love them often. I, I got no problems with that. But there are some, it's like, you know, I, I appreciate you saying that, but you show it so that you don't need to say it, but you show it. I, I do both because, you know, you, you know, if you sometimes would just get off your high horse and say, I love you, man. And I love you, man. But legitimately, 
you know, but, but whatever, okay? The twice mentioned thing, that it's established. Now, we're going to look at, continue to look at this, okay? But now, since it's established, like here in verse 32, it is because the thing is established by God, and God will shortly bring it to pass. Now, because it's established to God, there ought to be some steps taken, right? Precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little, there a little. You get it? You get it, right? Now, therefore, let Pharaoh look out a man discreet and wise, wisdom acquainted with the fear of the Lord, and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh do this, and let him appoint officers over the land, and take up the fifth part of the land of Egypt in the seven plenteous years, and let them gather all the food of those good years that come, and lay up corn under the hand of Pharaoh, and let them keep food in the cities. And that food shall be for store to the land against the seven years of famine, which shall be in the land of Egypt that the land perish not through the famine. And since it was a, uh, doubled to Pharaoh twice, established by God and going to bring to pass, what happened was, because of that, people moved and prepared for coming judgment. And the food famine thing, that'll be a good, uh, that'll be a good thing where we go through this uh, in a different light. Food famine thing, that, that's a good verse, a uh, good verse, good thing for this. But we see this, this concept of the twice mentioned, okay? Now, we've looked at Genesis. Go to Samuel, 1 Samuel now. And see, this coincides with sometimes you really got to stop and just like, what am I missing here? Like I said, and this came up because of uh, bro, uh, our dear brother sent the video and uh, went through it. It's like, yeah. And then the, the mention of uh, like using the same word twice in a verse in different ways. But the same word. Even in that, it's like you better pay. When the Lord doubles something like that, you better pay attention. 1 Samuel 3, verses 7 on to verse 11. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, neither was the word of the Lord yet revealed unto him. And the Lord called Samuel the third time. We're not looking at the times that Samuel was called. We're going to be looking at a specific thing, okay? All right? And he arose and went to Eli and said, Here, I, here am I, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Okay. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. And the Lord came and stood, stood, and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Samuel heard his voice, didn't he, before. So it wasn't a thing of him being heard. Okay, I, come on. Obviously Samuel heard because he thought Eli was like, dude, what do you want? And Eli's like, go to bed. It's like, dude, you did. Lay down. He says anything to you, say, again, say, Lord, your servant heareth. Speak, Lord, your servant heareth. Okay? The actual hearing Samuel got. What's the significance of Samuel, Samuel? Then Samuel answered, Speak, for thy servant heareth. Look at verse 11. The thing established as it was established with Isaac. And behold, the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel. Established. At which both the ears of everyone that heareth it shall tingle. And you go ahead and read on your own time. Isn't that something, brother? Sister? Hmm? 
Maybe, maybe we'll all start taking a little bit more time, huh? Or giving a little bit more time? As the Lord leads. Another kind of thing in this that the Lord showed me. 1 Kings chapter 11. Solomon. How many times did the Lord appear to Solomon? Twice. And did not the Lord establish Solomon as king of Israel? I mean, we all know what Solomon did and whatnot, but in his days, he was not dethroned. He had a lot of stuff come his way because his uh, foreign wives turned away his heart, yes. But his kingdom was established regardless while he was alive. Solomon. 1 Kings chapter 11 Verses 9 on to verse 11. And I found while, God, while the Lord was putting this together that the uh, parallels of Samuel and 1 Kings with the 11 and the 9 and the numerics <laughs> was just pretty interesting. Okay, that, that's the numerology thing of Scripture. That's, or numeric thing, that's above my pay grade, okay? Our uh, one dear brother from overseas, that's more his line because he's into that kind of stuff. And great, but that's a little above me, but I, I found that very interesting. First Kings 11, verses 9 on to verse 11. After Solomon done messed up, and the Lord was angry with Solomon, because his heart was turned from the Lord God of Israel, which had appeared unto him twice. And in that twice appearing unto Solomon, Solomon's kingdom was established. He, he messed up. He had people attacking him because he messed up. But Solomon, as long as he lived, was not thrown off the throne. It happened to Rehoboam, his son. Okay, so Solomon's kingdom, earthly kingdom, was established. Clue, okay? And had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods, but he kept not that which the Lord commanded. Wherefore the Lord said unto Solomon, For as much as this is done of thee, and thou hast not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded thee, I will surely rend the kingdom from thee and will give it to thy servants. Verse 12. Verse 12. Notwithstanding in thy days, I will not do it for David thy father's sake. So in his days, while Solomon himself was alive, it was not taken. His kingdom was established unto him while he was alive. Verse 11. Yeah, he's going to take it from him. But verse 12. What do you do with verse 12? Notwithstanding, in thy days I will not do it for David thy father's sake. Right there. So while he was alive, his kingdom was established to him. But I will rend it out of the hand of thy son. So ultimately, yes, the kingdom was taken away from him. But while he lived, that kingdom was established because the Lord appeared to him twice. That's something. And that's something. Now the one that everyone was probably thinking about. I know when um, when uh, talking to our brother, Brother Alexander Hartley, um, that this this came up immediately. I think yeah, I think you were the one even who came up with it too, didn't you? But uh, Matthew chapter seven, verses twenty one on to verse twenty three. Note the difference here. Note the difference, the contrast here. What we've looked at thus far about the Lord doing things in twice fashion of a manner. No, Abraham, Abraham, Samuel, Samuel. He appeared, you know, um, Pharaoh had the dream twice. He appeared unto Solomon twice. But now notice the difference here. Matthew chapter 7, verses 21 on to verse 23. You are because you say you are, huh? Huh? You are because you say you are. Writing that down so I don't forget it for links. Okay? You are because you say you are, huh? Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, 
explored. And with what we've already looked at, the twice mentioned thing, it's from what evidence we have seen thus far. We can go deeper in this, but I wanted to just give this to you to help some of you brethren with your study of Scripture. This twice mentioned thing. It's man, built on an establishing of something, right? We got the evidence right here before us that we've looked at. But look at what's this context. Considering that this is for the kingdom of heaven where it's all works. Keep that in mind. Not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, the actual, physical, literal kingdom with the Lord sitting on the throne in Jerusalem. Okay? But he that doeth the will of my Father, which is in heaven, many will say to me in that day, Lord, 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 Lord. Establishing. Okay? Lord, Lord, hey! And unlike the examples we have looked at previously, Who's the one saying the Lord, Lord? Have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful works? Remember what we looked at in Genesis uh, 22, 7 on the verse 12? For now I know you fear the Lord. No relation. See, relationship. What's lacking in this Lord, Lord? And then will I profess unto them, I never knew you. Ooh, isn't that beautiful? Not that, that but the tie-in there with Genesis 22. I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. This is also a good tie-in with Genesis 7, okay, with verse 12. All right? Now I know you fear the Lord. Okay? Relational. These guys, Lord, Lord, hey, look at us. The Lord, Lord, significant like establishing. They, they, man, establishing themselves. You are because you say you are? You're my brother because you say you're my brother? <sighs> Who's doing the establishing? In the mouth of two or three witnesses? Hmm? Oh, we can go off on that one for hours, man. You see that? The examples that we have looked at thus far in the twice mentioned thing, who is the one establishing it? Come on, we all know. Right here, it's a different aspect, isn't it? But yet, just like the devil, you know, with the temptation of Jesus, it is written, it is written, okay? It is written, all right? And in Luke specifically, it says, it is written, it is written twice, and then he says, it is said. But elsewhere it says, he does, it is written three times. Very interesting to note as well. But Satan also is like, it is written, okay? You understand what we're, what we're getting at, don't you, brother, sister? You lost people, you're gone. <laughs> you're like... Dude, what are you talking about? This this video isn't meant for you. The previous one that was recorded earlier. Feast on that. Okay? Now, Acts chapter 9. This, you know, like I said, this just came about because of our dear brother. And um, it's like just something i got to share with you. Acts 9, verses 1 on to verse 6. Here's another incident. Okay. Now, every second mention kind of thing, twice mention, is not always the Lord establishing things. But, because we just saw in Matthew, okay, that's dependent on context. But there again, when you see the Lord using the same word in different variation within that verse, it's establishing something. Okay. You could say, well, Brad, there's a couple of verses where it says Nathan three times. That's a different context, okay? That's a different context. Context, remember? What, what's the saying? Uh, a, context, a pretext without a context is something? I don't know. But context is important, okay? So Acts 9, verses 1 on to verse 6. 
and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went on to the high priests and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, this way, okay, Jesus Christ, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me, okay? Whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus. And suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. A uh, question. Do you think Paul's attention was captivated with the light? Come on. Come on. Okay. Okay. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul. Saul, why persecutest thou me? Thing of establishment, establishing something. In Matthew 7, lost people, people who the Lord did not know, were trying to establish themselves. But the Lord says, I don't know you. The dream of Pharaoh. It was established. Steps were taken because of that establishing. Genesis chapter 22. He knew. Relational. Okay? Relational. Okay? For Samuel. He established Samuel to be uh, the last judge. Okay? The last judge. And also to be a prophet. Okay? King Solomon. While he lived, his kingdom was established. We just saw it. It was, it was taken away from him, yes, but while he lived, that's the key to this point, okay? While he was alive, the kingdom was established to him. He died and went to Rehoboam, and the Lord's like, you're out of here, okay? Okay, but while he lived, it was established. The establishing thing is the point, okay? All right. So, and with that shoe, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? The Lord set him to establish something or someone. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> and he said, Who art thou, Lord? Leonard, Leonard Ravenhill had, I believe, a very accurate thing on that when he did exactly that. It's like, Who art thou? Lord, are you the Lord? Okay. Saul's attention was gotten. He heard. Okay, he heard. Come on. He, he went blind temporarily because of the light. Okay, his attention was got. The Lord got his attention. He said, Saul, Saul. And what happens? And he said, who art thou, Lord? Paul addressed, or Saul, was like, Lord? God? Father? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Establishing something. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. Hmm. Verse seven, and the men which stood, uh, and the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no men. Even the even the guys. That's more evidence that the Saul Saul was not for the Lord to be like, hey, got your attention? No, no, no. That was an establishing of something. And um, skip down to verse um. Verses 13 on to verse 16 now. Then Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints, oh, excuse me, to thy Christians, to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, Go thy way, 
for he is a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. And we all know what became of the Apostle Paul. From murderer to messenger. Sorry. Okay? Okay. One more stop and then we'll be done. Hebrews chapter 9. A lot of Christianity wants to remove the breaking process that is necessary for the Lord to save you. And they just want to, they want to, they want to forgo all the necessary things that will lead you on to the Lord. But these are necessary things, being broken, having contrition, fearing the Lord. And see, when you are broken, contrite, and fear the Lord, all you want to do is like, Lord, save me. Hebrews 9, verses 24 and verse 28. For Christ is not entered into the holy place made with hands, which are... The figures of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Nor yet that he should off, offer himself often, as the high priest entereth into the holy place every year with the blood of others. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. But now once, pay attention, once in the end of the world hath he appeared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. And as it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, the judgment. Verse 28. So Christ was once offered to bear the sins of many. And unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time. Without sin to salvation. Second time, ye must be born again, a new creature in Christ Jesus. And upon that second birth, are you not established to go to heaven? Once saved, always saved. Praise the Lord. That's going to be it for this little video. Dear Saints, thank you so much for watching this if you do. Thank you for your prayers. Please continue to pray for us. We need all the prayers uh, we can get. And so do you. You know, people, Saints, seriously, um, you might be my brother, you might be my sister, but um, I'm not going to have fellowship with everybody but you want prayer requests you want your requests be also made known unto the body of Christ the church of God which is the church of the living God there are two emails there shoot me an email I have it's I, I have, I'm bad at getting emails I am I am I'm bad at that okay I get lots of spam Lots of spam. Lots and lots and lots of spam. And unless I go through my spam, I miss a lot of people. I do. I do. I'm bad at that. Okay. Um, certain brethren, of course, I keep an eye out for them. Obviously. Obviously. But like if people have, I, I've, I've gotten, um, you know, things on videos. It's like I've sent you emails. And it's like, and then, well, tell me who you are. Or give me something. And then I go into the spam folder. Where it's like, oh, well, it's, well, no wonder I didn't see it. So you want prayer requests? It's like, you know, hey, Brother Brad, 
you know, can you put this in your community section so, you know, others can, let me know. Okay? I'll do that. Absolutely. So, thank you for watching this if you do. I love you. Hopefully this will help you to go a little deeper. So, thank you. See you in the next video.